Hi, welcome to another session of the Potter's Roundtable from Washington Street Studios in Bolivar, West Virginia. I'm Phil Bernberg. Today we're going to be doing a presenting a discussion about the construction of a, of a gas-fired soda kiln at Washington Street Studios. And the presentation is going to be in three parts. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. Hi, this is part two of the description of our construction of our gas-fired soda kiln at Washington Street Studios. Last time, in the first section, we had sort of introduced the design and how we had done some initial planning, and we had talked about the construction of the kiln base and starting to raise the walls of the kiln. So the next point we reached was starting to raise the, the ch raising the chimney in the kiln. So as we were starting to increase the height of the chimney, we noticed that the, the concrete, we we're constantly checking the level. This is one thing that's really important when you're building a kiln, is to, is to check the level of the bricks. We're not using any mortar at all. We're just dry stacking the bricks. So, and the bricks, in spite of what they say, are not exactly the same size, so that if you don't constantly, if you're just laying bricks down and you don't check the level, a sixteenth of an inch a difference in the bricks can add up after a while and you can find you're way out of level after several courses. So it's really important to keep checking the level. And what we did a lot of, we'd swap bricks. We'd put a couple of bricks down, check the level. If they weren't, if, they, if we thought they were too thick or too thin, we'd, we'd, we'd find other bricks that were slightly different thickness and swap them in and constantly check the level. So as we were starting to raise the chimney, we realized that the concrete block, the concrete base was probably not perfectly level, and we had to level the bricks. So what we decided to do was to just occasionally shim, put a little shim between one of the, layer, the layers of bricks. In this case, we just used a small layer of dry refractory cement. This is a high aluminous cement, and so instead of even using it wet, we just would just put a little, it wasn't thick, very thick at all, we just put a small layer of powder between the bricks to act as a shim to level it up. So that's what this is showing here, where we, we only had to do this a couple of times, where we, we, we shimmed the bricks basically with the aluminous cement. So now as we were, as we were starting to construct the chimney, now that we, were, we had re-leveled the bricks, we wanted to also include, in terms of the features of the kiln, passive dampers. And passive dampers are basically just openings in the chimney where you can bleed off some of the draw of the chimney. So they're at the bottom of the chimney before the chimney enters actually or connects to the wear chamber. And the idea, they work the same way that some vacuum, like canister vacuum cleaners work, where on the, close to the handle, you can open a small hole and it reduces the suction basically of the vacuum. Well, that's the same idea here. By opening, by opening these, these passageways in the bottom of the chimney, we can reduce the draw, the draw or the pull on the chimney. And we wanted to incorporate several of these. So this is showing we've raised the, the, the chimney now up several levels above the dampers. And this is, we started to build two openings in the back wall of the chimney. And these are, these are going to be the, the plugs. They're removable. So this, they're partially sticking out. So this is just showing the beginning of the construction of the two, pa of two passive damper openings in the back of the chimney. And then now we're looking where we've covered them over. And this, these are the two openings that will be plugged by the bricks. The other thing, the passive dampers, the passive dampers are, are useful for several reasons. During a firing, if you're actually getting a lot of draft, Sometimes the, the, um, the movement of the dampers can become very critical and, very, and almost like too sensitive, like so that an eighth of an inch movement of the damper can make a big change. And you can, you can reduce that sensitivity if you can reduce the draft. So if you can open, open a passive damper and reduce the pull on the wear chamber, then the movement of the dampers doesn't become quite so critical and you have a little more leeway. Plus what I've also found is passive dampers are very useful at the end of a firing when, you, when the firing is done and you close up the kiln completely, one way to help air from entering the chimney is to open the passive dampers so that the chimney is not continuing to pull air into the kiln. You can close off the burner ports and you can close off all your other burner ports, but, I, but and even if you close the dampers, sometimes you can get leakage because the chimney is still pulling. So by opening the passives, you can reduce the pull of the chimney on the wear chamber. 
Okay, so this is now just showing a top view, looking down at the chimney. This is the this is the chi the flue, and you can see down in here. Those are the two passive damper openings, and we decided we actually wanted to add a third passive damper opening. So this is this is the construction of the third. There are the two lower ones, and this is the third. And again, you can see I mentioned before we we always have a three brick lintel. So here are our three bricks over this opening, the three bricks over this opening, and the three bricks over that opening, basically to support the weight. So that, and it's especially important for an opening like this where you need to have a plug because if this were to crunch down and crack and, and, and sag, we wouldn't be able to remove the brick or possibly ins reinsert the brick. And now one thing, we one thing we decided to do when we had gotten up to a certain height above the passive dampers, we decided that we no longer needed to have the, um, the outside layer of the bricks be super duty bricks anymore. We had, sta we had stayed with the, with the one kind of bricks, even supers on the outside, just because it, was, it made construction a whole lot easier because the bricks were closer in size. But at this point, we decided to replace the outside layer in the chimney with the high heat bricks. The problem was the high heat bricks are, even though they're nominally considered the same size, they're not. So in order for them to fit snugly around the, the inner layer of bricks, we had to cut all the bricks. So this, this illustration is just showing approximately how much we had to cut off of each high heat brick so that we could stack them around the, the super duty bricks. Now, now, we, now going back, while we're talking about the wall of the kiln, one of the things, before we go back to actually raising the wall, raising the walls, was we wanted to include the, the ability to measure the temperature. So this is showing an, a hole that we created, a, a port, a small port that we created in the right-hand wall of the kiln for a thermocouple. So this is about, a, this is a six-inch long a mullite thermocouple protection tube. And this is, this is a small opening there. This, we're looking from the inside of the kiln here. And this is showing where the, will, will the tube will be. And I think we have another view showing how we constructed the, the opening. We basically, in order to make the opening, because the opening was a little, the, the tube was about an inch thick, we took a split. This, this is just showing, for, this is a normal brick, and this is what's called a split. It's a standard brick size. It's basically, it's a brick that's half as thick. So by taking, a, by taking a split and cutting a piece out of it, and then stacking these two pieces, we create a gap that's this wide, and that's what we, we were able to use for the, for the thermocouple probe. So this is this is this is a half a split here, and this is this is the the shortened piece of split. The nice thing is also is that this tube doesn't go all the way. This is showing the tube sticking through. A, it's sticking about two inches into the wear chamber, but you can also use the piece that we cut off as a plug on the outside when we're not using this at all. Okay, so now this is looking. Now we're start, What we're starting to do? We're we're starting to to work on the end walls of the chimney, of, of the, sorry, the end walls of the kiln. We've gotten the chimney up to a certain point and we're, we're going back to the walls. And so one of the things, what we're looking at here is we're looking at the burner, the front wall of the kiln, the, the front end wall of the burner wall. And we're looking down, down here is one of the burner ports and up here higher on the wall, we're gonna be constructing the two soda ports for the injection of the soda. One of the things, one of the additional features that we wanted to incorporate in this kiln was some way to control some of the mess or the overspray that you get from soda spraying. Soda, when you spray the soda in, sometimes it can be a really messy process and you remove the nozzle from the kiln and there's still soda solution dribbling out of it and it runs down the face of the kiln and even lands on the burners and it's very, it can be very corrosive. So we want to just provide some way to catch that. So we constructed uh, two shelves that would stick out from the face of the kiln below the soda ports to catch any drips and debris from firing. So that's what this is showing. By turning two bricks sideways, that's a burner port down here. By turning two bricks sideways, we could create this little half brick long shelf that would be located below the, burn, below the soda ports. And now this is, enough, now we've, we've built it up a little higher here. We've built up the chimney a little higher and we're building up the end walls. So this is showing, this, there's the two burner ports right here. This is a preliminary construction. Remember I mentioned earlier on how we wanted to build up some burner port extensions. That would be little tunnels that sit outside the kiln. So this is just a preliminary mock-up, like we're playing with, with large Legos a little preliminary mock-up of how we might construct that burner port extension. But the point is, so here are two shelves that we have. 
that are gonna protrude below the soda ports. The soda ports will be directly above the burners, but these are our two sort of protective shelves. And at this point, we've built up the, the, um, the, the, this end wall and the back end wall to about two thirds or three quarters of the final height of the walls. And we've gotten the chimney up high enough to the point where at this point we, we wanted to work, we can continue the chimney, but we wanted to start going back working on the body of the, of the kiln because we wanted to basically move on to start creating the arch. So we have to complete the end walls of the kiln. So this is showing now we've raised up, this is the, the front of the kiln again. We've raised up the, the, the wall even higher and we st we've built the two, the, the two soda ports. The soda ports were, ba were basically a, a split, I'm sorry, a soap wide, they were a soap wide and two, and two brick heights. And they were, they were, they, they were narrow enough, but we, we wanted them to be large enough so that when we put the spray nozzle in there, we could get complete overlapping coverage of the front face of the, the wear stack. So we wanted to make sure that, that it wasn't random, that if we wanted to, we could get complete coverage of the soda. So by having the two this tall and this wide, we found out by, by siding through them, we could completely cover the whole inside, the front face of the wear stack with the soda. And this, this right here represents what will become the final height for this end wall, this front end wall. Okay, so now this is basically the completed front end wall of the kiln. We have, the, we have the base down here, we have our two burner ports, our protective shelves, and our two soda ports. And this is a view now of the same stage, but I want, wanted to point out a particular feature that, remember I mentioned we had two, we have, we have two tiers or two layers to, the wall, to the, all the walls, and they're not connected, but in this case, and that's called a running bond, basically, where the bricks are going along each layer and they're not crossing. But in this case, we did what's called a header course, and we purposely cross the bricks on the wall rather than having them run this way because the, this is the layer of bricks that the arch is going to rest on. And we wanted the, the, arch, the weight of the arch to be supported by the complete end wall, not just the inside layer of bricks. And the, the, the arch will actually be touching down above the inside layer, but we didn't want the, it, the weight only supported on the inside layer. But by, so by crossing the bricks this way, now the weight of the arch is, is, is spread on both layers of bricks, on the inside and the outlines. So it's essentially tying the two layers together, but it's also better supporting the weight in a better way. So now what we've done is we've built up the, the back. This is the, a view from the left-hand side of the kiln looking through what will become the door opening. And you notice there's our little our thermocouple tube protruding from the, the right-hand side wall. And we planned the height of that to be at about the mid-height of the, of the wear stack. So that we were estimating, we knew approximately how high the, the arch was going to be. So we planned the height of that to be roughly in the, the mid-height with respect to the stack of the wear. And so now we've built up the, the, the rear end wall of the kiln to be the same as the front. And what we're checking here is we're checking the level. Because again, it's very important to keep everything level so that the weight doesn't shift. And the, and, and the kiln will naturally expand and contract and the bricks will move a little bit during the firing. And if, there's a, if, if it's not level, then things will start to slide as well as move and they'll slide out of position. So in this case, we're checking the level. And as, I don't know whether you can see that little bubble, but it's just about perfectly level between the front and the back, which is great. What I've also shown here, you can, there are several things you can see in here. We've set five bricks in the door because that's the way the door will be constructed, by just fitting the bricks. So the, brick, the door will be five bricks wide um, with a little bit of gap to allow them to be inserted easily. And then you can also, you can see the damper in its slot here in the back and the gap between the, the kiln body and this little passageway where the damper slot is located and then the chimney. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. And consider becoming a patron of our channel. Visit www.patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Any amount you give will support the creation of a digital library of educational videos and podcasts to support artists, potters, and educators now and into the future. If you would like more information about our membership studio, classes, events, and multimedia productions at Washington Street Studios, visit our website at www.hfclay.com. And so now it was time, once we had raised the, the, um, 
the end walls to their final height, it was time to start planning the arch. So the first thing we did was we measured the distance between the two end walls. And of course, the arch has to be at least as, as wide or wider than that, di than that distance. So just to plan, I like playing with Legos and blocks and stuff. So we just laid out, just working on a work table, we were working with number one arch bricks, which we had salvaged from the previous kiln. And so we laid out just sort of a preliminary plan on a work table to get an idea about what kind of a brick arrangement, what kind of brick sequence could we use that would, that would give us the approximate span or the distance between these two, the two end walls. So that's what this is showing. These are arch bricks and some straights on the end. And we've just laid it out and pushed them close together the same way they would be sitting on the arch, just to get an idea about, about you know, sort of preliminary planning for the arch. And we, we wanted to do what's the kind of arch construction that's called a bonded arch, which is shown down here, where the joints alternate. It's a little more complicated to build than, than, a, than what's on, on a ring arch. In this case, the bricks are just put in, in, in rings to, to span the thing, but it's possible with use for the bricks to separate sideways. So this gives a lot more strength to the arch, especially where we don't have any way of restraining the end of the arch. We have an open side, for instance, where the door is, and an open side, and there's nothing, there's no way to clamp them. So this ties, especially these end rings, it ties them together, rather, so that way we wouldn't get any separation. So this is what we were doing. We were doing what's called a bonded arch. And this just shows some, some terminology with respect to arch construction. So this is, here's a kiln wall, and here's my end kiln wall. The rise of an arch is the distance, is the distance above, from the, on the inside of the arch, above that baseline. So here's the, here are the bricks, the arch bricks, resting on the end wall. And the rise is that internal distance, that height. The span of an arch is the distance, the inside distance of the arch from where it touches down. So this is the span from here to here, and that's the rise. And those are two important things to decide when you're building an arch. How high do you want the rise to be, and how wide does the span need to be to completely you know, go span the distance or cover the distance between the end walls? And so in this case, we wanted an arch. It's a small kiln, but I wanted the, the rise to be fairly high because it's a, it creates a more stable arch. It's the, the more sta we, know, we know that in the course of firing a kiln, bricks are going to move, and the arch is probably going to sag a little bit, and it may drop, even though it's supported. Um, but the higher the arch is, the more room I have for the arch to drop and sag a little bit before it actually collapses. If this is a very low arch, very lo lo small rise, then it wouldn't take much for it to drop down almost horizontally and start to collapse. So in this case, the higher the rise, the better, up to a certain point. So we wanted a fairly large rise for this arch. So now this is where we're sort of, we've worked out sort of a final a plan for the arch. And we're, we're checking in this case, and what it ended up with is four straights, one, two, three, four straights, and then a series of number one arches, and then four straights. And this gave us a combination of the, the, the curve that we wanted, and also, we were, in, in this case, we're confirming that with this arrangement that we'll get the span that we needed. Now, the span had to be slightly wider than the gap between the two end walls, because this is the point where the arch will be resting on the end wall, right here, this lower edge of the brick. So that has to be, that can't, can't be right at the edge of the brick, it has to be further back. So we planned this edge to be an inch, an inch back from the edge on both end walls. So the, the distance between the two end walls, I believe, was 45 inches. So we planned for a 47-inch span. So we'd have an inch setback. In the, so this is just confirming that, yes, this sequence will give it. Now, again, this, if, we, if we laid the bricks in like that, that would just be a ring arch. So this isn't the way the bricks are going to be arranged, but it's the sequence of the bricks that would give us the distance. Okay, now this is a, I wanted to show this because this, we found this was a really useful tool, as simple as it is, when we, for constructing the kiln. We, we took a piece of, of uh, this masking tape and we laid it, we, we adhered it to the inside layer, the inside um, surface of the arch that I just showed in the previous, uh, the previous slide. And we marked off the point where it touches down on one end and the point where it touches down on the other end. So we had a, a pretty accurate measurement of that actual length of that, that it was going to take to go from one contact point to the other. 
Because the problem is, like, I tried using a cloth rule like is used for sewing, and the problem is you can't stick it to the, to the arch to measure it, and of course the metal tape won't, won't, it won't bend, you know, flexibly enough to really give you a good accurate reading. So the tape was a very good, was a very good indication. So that's one of the marks right there, that black mark you can see, another one down here, indicates exactly where the, the, the arch would touch down on the, on the, on the end walls. Then this, now, the next thing at this point was we needed to start thinking about constructing some kind of a form or support um, to, uh, to, to, well, for actually construction of the arch. So this is the, the general idea that we had for constructing it. There would be two plywood panels on the sides, two by fours at the bottom, and then a series of, um, a, a series of cross pieces attached to the plywood panels, and then we'd lay a piece of masonite over the top of it. So this was the, this was the idea, that the general plan. I've used this, this plan before, and this works really well. Keeping in mind also that the form has to be light enough so that when you're done, you can remove it, so that you don't need 15 people to remove the arch form. It's gotta be light and maneuverable enough. And this works very well. And this is the way, this is showing how the form would be set in place. So this is, this is again, the top of the arch supporting wall here and here. These are, this, is, this is the burner wall, and this is the back wall by the chimney. So the arch form would be set in there on shims, and it would be raised and lowered just enough so that when the bricks are set on it, they just touch down. So that keeping that same sequence of bricks I had before, we'd adjust the height of the form so that it would accommodate that series of bricks. They just touch using these, and these are adjustable, or remo a series of small shims that we can re remove. And the idea is you put in the, the form, you lay the bricks on top, you knock the shims out, you drop the form down, and then you remove the form, and hopefully the, the arch remains standing. So now we're starting to actually build the form. So we, now we've taken, this is a two by four foot sheet of chipboard. It's about three eighths of an inch thick. And I found I really like to use this because it's very stiff and very strong. Um, and it, it, will, it will take the weight. It's certainly strong enough to support the weight, but it's not so heavy that it makes the, the, the form itself very heavy. So we've laid out, we've laid out the, the same arch sequence on top of it. And now we're gonna, we're gonna take a pencil and we mark the curve that the, um, the shape of the curve that the arch is producing to transfer it to his so that we can cut it out. So this is showing, I've just marked it, and this is also showing where I've, I've planned to have a two by four at the bottom of the arch form to give it strength. So I don't have the, I don't have the, the, the chipboard running right across the bottom of the arch, I've provided this additional height for strength. Because I can adjust that with bricks to any thickness I want inside. So this is, this is really for strength of the arch form. So I've transferred that now to one of the two by four foot panels. And then on the next slide, we're starting to cut it out. So I just used a saber saw or a, 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 a jigsaw to cut it out. And I'm cutting it, I'm cutting along that curve. And it was easier to trace it rather than try to, you know, draw a theoretical curve or something. Because remember, I've got straight sections at the end. One of the other things I didn't mention earlier is I put the straights at the end because most of the, the weight on the brick would be pushing down on them and the straights would be less likely to slide and move in. I couldn't use straights toward the top of the arch because there's nothing holding them. They could drop down in. So I had to use arch bricks at the top where they're, where they're tapered so that they, wouldn't, they couldn't drop in. But I could use straights toward the bottom of the arch because there's so much pressure on them, they're basically clamped together. And, they're, not, and they're, they're closer to being horizontally oriented, so they're not likely to slide or drop. And then in the next view, there's one of the completed end panels cut out of one of the two by four foot sheets. So this will allow a two by four to be placed crossways this way down here, and then the smaller cross pieces can go like that, connecting to the other one. So now, before I went any further, um, you know, this is like the old rule, like the carpenter who says, you know, I've cut this board twice and it's still too short. Well, I've done that too many times, so I wanted to make sure before we proceeded that this, even though this looked good, that it was going to fit. So in this case, I've taken this, the one single a side panel, and I've put it back onto the kiln. I've propped it up with a board here, it's just leaning, and I've shimmed it up temporarily just with some pieces of brick. And I wanted to just make sure that, does it fit into the opening, and does it look like it's going to work? So that I can, can I shim it up and down enough to give me the height? And the answer is, yeah, it looked like it was gonna work pretty well. So I could go ahead and cut the second one out. 
And again, this is just showing a close-up where I've just temporarily, I've shimmed it with, with bricks. And the idea is so the bricks will be stacked on top of the arch form and they'll come down and rest on the, on the, on the surface of this end wall. So now I've, 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 I've built, I cut out the second, um, I cut out the second end panel and I've, I've connected them with two, two two by fours and just a temporary third cross piece here just to, to, so I can move it around. And what I did was now I went back again as far as checking and I set this inside the, the curve of the arch that I established because I noticed when I was cutting out the chipboard, it was very hard with the jigsaw to follow the line precisely because the chipboard is great, it's very hard, but it's made up with a fairly hard, rigid cement. And so when you're cutting the chipboard, you can you occasionally, you'll hit a part where you hit mostly wood, and then you hit another part where you hit mostly cement. And so it tends to, it tends to move the blade around. So it's very hard to find a precise fit. So what I wanted to do here was go back and adjust the curve on the form to be exactly the same as the inside of the arch. So I'm showing here an angle grinder with a grinding wheel on it. So I went back and I ground off the surface of this, of the edge of the, this curved uh, shipboard panel to fit exactly into the curve of the arch. And I did the same thing on both sides. So I really know that I wasn't gonna have sort of a wavy fit because again, I'm gonna be laying a piece of masonite over it. So I wanted a smooth curve, not a wiggly curve with bumps and things on it. So there's the completed frame. I still have to put the masonite on top, which I'll do later, but there's the completed frame for the, uh, for the, the art support form. I've got the two chipboard side panels, and I've got these cross pieces. These are two by twos. These two by fours at the bottom, two by twos here. And I've made the, the top surface of the two by two flush with the side, the edge of the masonite panel so that I can, I can completely cover the whole thing with a, with a piece of masonite later on. And then this, again, just to check, now that I got into this stage, I put the form back on the kiln again, and I wanted to make sure now that that, for instance, was it level? So that was the top surface of this cross piece level with respect to the rest of the kiln and just was it level? And did the whole form easily fit in place? And it did. So now at this point, I can't do it, I can't go any further really on the arch construction until I build, add the supporting metal framework around the whole kiln. And before I can do that, I need to complete the chimney. So at this point, we were finished with the, with the body construction on the kiln, and we were working on the chimney. So this shows the completion of the chimney. And again, we're constantly checking the level of the bricks on the chimney. And then finally, this is the completed chimney structure shown from the left-hand side. And as you notice here now, the width of the chimney varies. So this is where, right about down here, we had, we had completed using, right about here, we had completed using, um, super duty bricks for the outside layer and we changed to high heats and we, rate, we, we, we brought the double layer up to fit underneath the roof of the pavilion and the idea for that was we had planned that this was planned from the very beginning I wanted the roof to protect the damper slot because I didn't want rain and snow and leaves and everything to accumulate down into this gap here so we had planned this in the beginning so that the location of the, of the chimney so that the roof would overlap it so the roof is overlapping the outside layer, and then we continue the chimney with just a single layer above the chimney. So this is the completed chimney. You can see the, this, the damper slot down here. This is the door. This, by the way, this is, the, this is a, a sort of a, a vent pipe for, the, for the, the small gas kiln that was sitting there to the right of the kiln. Well, we hope that this discussion has been useful today for you, and we know that this was a lot of information probably presented in one time, but if you, so if you'd like to hear it again, you can listen to our podcast version of this presentation. Just look for the Potter's Roundtable on your favorite podcast platform. Okay, so that's the end. That's, this is the end of the second part of the construction of our soda gas kiln. And thank you for visiting with us today. Stay tuned for part three. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.